This is just a sample of the audiobook. To get the complete audiobook access the link posted in the first comment. Hill in Cheviot Hill, Scotland in the year 1825. Twenty-five men formed a company for the purpose of emigrating. These men built themselves a bark and, when ready to sail, held a council to determine whether their destination would be India or America. A vote was taken, which resulted in a tie, thus forcing the captain to cast his ballot. He voted for America, and by doing so, destined me to fight Indians instead of hunting Bengal tigers in India. My father was one of the company, and his brother was the captain. I was just two years and ten months of age when we landed at New Orleans. My father had means, and we traveled all over the States, finally settling in St. Louis eighteen months later. Here I remained until I was twenty years of age, receiving five years of schooling. In the meantime, chills and fevers were undermining my constitution, and the doctor ordered a change of climate. My father made arrangements with a party of hunters and trappers who were in St. Louis at the time to allow me to accompany them on their next trip, which would last a year. The party consisted of eight men, all free trappers, with Bill Williams and Perkins as leaders. These two men had had fifteen years' experience on the plains amongst Indians, and had a wide reputation for fearless courage and daring exploits. A good trading outfit was purchased, one-third of which my father paid for, giving me a corresponding interest in the trip. We started in the spring of 1842 with wagons and pack animals, making for Independence, Missouri, which was the headquarters for all mountaineers in those days. At Independence, we sold our wagons and rigged up a complete pack outfit, as our route would take us where it would be difficult for wagons to travel. I was still wearing my city clothes, and mountain men present asked Williams what he was going to do with that city lad in the mountains. This remark cut me deeply, and I hurried to the frontier store and traded all my fine clothes, shirts, and dickies, which were worn in those days, for two suits of the finest buckskin such as these merchants always kept on hand to fleece greenhorns like myself, making five hundred percent profit in the trade. Next morning I appeared dressed a la prairie, and the old trappers noticed the change and said, Williams, that boy of yours will make a mountaineer if he catches on at this rate. We all went to work getting our pack outfit ready, which was accomplished before night. Next morning, the 15th of March, 1842, we started, bidding adieu to the remaining mountain men who were all making preparations to start their different routes for trapping and trading. The trappers and traders of that day were brave and reckless men, who never gave a second thought to the danger in their calling. We made good time and reached Salt Creek on March 20th. Camp had just been made when we saw in the distance a small herd of buffalo coming directly towards us. Williams gave orders to corral all stock. No second order was needed with these mountain men who acted in unison like a flash when occasion called for action. The stock was barely secured when the buffalo passed in close vicinity of camp, followed by thirty painted Kiowa warriors. A wild and savage-looking outfit they were. I had seen many Indians in St. Louis at different times, but none so wild and savage as these were. It was at this time that I received my first lesson in how to deal with wild Indians, or, more properly speaking, how to control their overt acts. Our packs were placed in a triangle, answering in case of need to a good breastwork. Each man was armed with a rifle, two pistols, a tomahawk, and a large knife, commonly called toothpicker. Besides this, two of our men had bows and arrows, and were experts with them. The Indians came up and examined our outfit and demanded pay for passing through their country. Williams gave them to understand that they would not go through the outfit, nor would they receive pay for passing through the country, informing them that this was Pawnee country. The Kiowas at that time were semi-hostile, robbing and killing when it could be done with impunity. I stood by Williams during the parley, much interested in the conversation, which was entirely by signs. The rest of the men were in what we called our fort, with stern and savage looks on their faces. Williams was well up in Indian ways and treatment in any and every emergency, 
and finally gave the leader, or chief as he called himself, some tobacco. They departed, looking daggers at us.